Welcome to episode 212 of FBI Retired Case File Review with Jerry Williams. I'm a retired agent on a mission to show you who the FBI is and what the FBI does through my books, my blog, and my podcast case reviews with former colleagues. Today, we get to speak to former agent Melissa Osborne, who served in the FBI for six years. During her bureau career, Melissa, a licensed pharmacist prior to her appointment, worked on a white collar crime squad in the Kansas City field office, investigating healthcare fraud, telemarketing fraud, and intellectual property rights. Melissa was also a member of the Kansas City field office evidence response team, ERT. In this episode, Melissa reviews the FBI major case, code name Diluted Trust. The investigation involved a Kansas City pharmacist, Robert Courtney, who diluted cancer drugs that he prepared for physicians. As a licensed pharmacist, Melissa Osborne lent her expertise to the chemo pharmacy fraud investigation. Robert Courtney pled guilty to intentionally diluting 98 thousand prescriptions given to 4,200 patients. Melissa left the FBI in 2003 and returned to her former profession as a pharmacist. Melissa was awarded the 2008 National Community Pharmacy Association's Preceptor of the Year Award for her work as a preceptor to pharmacy students sharing with them lessons learned from the diluted trust case. Melissa is working on a book about the investigation. I'm excited to present this case, my very first healthcare fraud case review. I hope you enjoy the episode. In this episode's show notes, I will include a link to a brand new documentary that came out in September 2020 about the case. Because this is a long episode, I'll keep the introduction short. I just want to thank you for listening. Of course, I want to welcome new listeners and invite you to join my reader team. This podcast is all about true crime, but if you're also interested in crime fiction, once a month via my monthly email, I keep you up to date on the FBI and books, TV, and movies. When you join my reader team, you get access to my FBI reading resource which is a colorful list of more than 50 books about the FBI written by the FBI agents who have been guests on this podcast. There is nonfiction, crime fiction, true crime, and memoir. You can join my reader team on my website or use the link in your podcast app's description of this episode. I want to thank you for your support. Now here's the show. I want to welcome my guest, Melissa Osborne. Hey, Melissa, how are you? Hi, Jerry. I'm great. Well, before we go any further, I want to give a shout out to Kelly Pope. As soon as I realized that you were connected to this fraud case, I let Kelly know, oh, I want to talk to her too. So Kelly, thanks for connecting us. Thank you, Kelly. So I remember this case. This involves Robert Courtney and your investigation of the diluted trust case. Could you tell us, you know, give us a quick summary of what the case involved, and then we can start wherever you want to start. Okay, Jerry, thank you for having me. A brief summary of this case is a local Kansas City pharmacist would prepare chemotherapeutic IV medications for physicians in his general area of Kansas City. And we were able to find out that what he was doing is mixing these medications, but not putting the appropriate amount of chemo agents into the IV. And some cases he didn't put any medicine in the IV at all. We investigated him and it was an investigation that took us down a slippery slope in which we found out that his crimes went all the way back to the late 80s, early 90s. So he caused, one way or the other, the death of many cancer patients in the Kansas City area. It was a case that resonated in Kansas City and was pretty much on the mind of everybody every single day while we were doing the investigation. The thing that makes you the ideal person 
to work this case and to review the case with us is the fact that you were a pharmacist. So I would imagine that really, really made this case very special for you. Jerry, absolutely it did. When I joined the FBI, I had already been practicing it as a, as a pharmacist for seven years. And when I came in, I knew that there was a possibility that I would have an investigation that involved a pharmacy or pharmacist. But never in a million years did I think that something like this would happen. It, it upset me in many ways, made me angry, made me sad. It, it hit me in the core. I think that from the very beginning, it was something that I had a great passion for to investigate and help, you know, as much as possible. You know, there could have been a situation where this didn't really happen and it was just a mistake. And, you know, I wanted to make sure that when we did the investigation that we did it properly and we looked at the correct things. And luckily, I was in Kansas City as an FBI agent and I was assigned to the healthcare fraud unit. So many of my FBI friends said that it was just destiny that that happened because I was the only pharmacist pharmacist working for the FBI at that time. So even if I hadn't been a pharmacist, it would have hit me really hard, just like it hit everybody because we all know somebody or loved somebody who either battled and beat cancer or, you know, it took their life. So it, it was, it's a very personal case for everybody, but for me, it kind of had a little extra zing in it. Well, that's the reason this case is so interesting for me also because my mother did die of uh, breast cancer. The very first moment I heard about information that actually would lead to this case and lead to Robert Courtney. I remember it like it was yesterday. I was actually in a car with my supervisor and her name is Judy Lewis Arnold and she had been working healthcare fraud for years and years. She's kind of the queen of healthcare fraud. We were in a car together, and as we were traveling down the road, she told me that she had received a phone call from the former United States attorney in Missouri. His name was Stephen Hill. He called her because he had received a call from another attorney. That attorney represented an unknown physician in the Kansas City area, and that attorney had told Hill that his client, the physician, believed that there was a pharmacist who was inappropriately mixing chemo IV medications for her and that he would like us to be involved, meaning the FBI. And he had also mentioned that the FDA would also be involved with this. Now, what I can tell you at that very moment that she said this to me, my first reaction was like somebody had thrown a ball and hit me in the stomach, knocked all the air out of me. You know, I, I, I could barely you know, get my breath. And, and I'm not someone who can't just talk all the time. So, I mean, they, it, it just took it out of me. But then I took a second and I thought, no, this possibly cannot be happening. There's no way a pharmacist would do this. It, it could easily be a mistake. Mistakes are made. You know, whether the product was bad or he measured it out wrong or something else happened. I really just did not believe that what the doctor was saying was true and that a pharmacist would do this on purpose. After this car ride with Judy, you know, we're at the FBI office in Kansas City and I learned that I'm going to be co-case agent on this and I would be paired with a 20 plus year veteran. His name was David Parker and basically he had all sorts of experience in all sorts of FBI investigations. Well, I had only been in the FBI since 1997. So, you know, I was kind of a newbie. Really, I was probably assigned this case, not because I was an FBI agent, but because I was a pharmacist. And I'd actually worked in pharmacies very similar to the ones that this Robert Courtney, who we would learn his name later, owned. So we spent time waiting and trying to organize a meeting between the FBI, FDA, the Stephen Hill, his office, the attorney who represented the physician. And we still didn't know the whole time who the physician was or who the pharmacist was. During the week of around July 26, 2001, I was actually in Quantico, Virginia. And I was involved in a conference of agents who had participated in undercover operations. And I can remember that we're sitting there talking and somebody comes into the, <laughs> the auditorium in Quantico and says, Melissa Osborne, your boss wants to talk to you. Of course, I'm like, 
oh gosh, what did I do now? Am I in trouble? So I go out and Judy says, okay, you need to go and grab your gear. You need to get to the airport and you need to fly back here tonight. We're going to meet with this doctor and Stephen Hill's office tomorrow morning. So I was like, oh, so, you know, basically I do, I, I run around and, you know, I'm on the plane and I can tell you I'm reflecting on all of this. There's lots of things going through my mind. I'm like, okay, are we going to find out that this was just a mistake? You know, I mean, do I have butterflies in my stomach for nothing? I was like, are, are we going to find out there is actually something to this case? Did a pharmacist really do something like this? And then I thought of all the people that I knew that had battled and either beat cancer or succumbed to it. And, you know, less than five years before, my roommate had passed away from breast cancer. So it was very personal for me on that regard. And also, I was proud of being a pharmacist. So the idea that somebody like him who was a pharmacist did this also bothered me. So there was a lot of things going through my mind. So the next day, I went to the FBI office and Judy Lewis, David Parker, and myself, we proceeded to go to Stephen Hill's law office in Kansas City, Missouri. And we actually met up with the FDA agents in the waiting room. Of course, we still didn't know who we were going to see or anything like that. And so we're waiting there. And then they escort us into a big conference room. So there was probably only about seven of us there total, six or seven. So we're in the conference room and we're waiting. And Stephen Hill comes in and behind him is a man and a lady. And Stephen introduces us to the lady and says, this is Dr. Verda Hunter. She is the physician who has come forward and wants us to look at this situation and see if there is a crime. And I can tell you what I remember from that day. We all went up to her, shook her hand and introduced ourselves. And I can remember looking at her and the devastation in her eyes and, and her demeanor. You could tell that this was so personal to her and she was devastated. I can only imagine, even though she had no idea, the level of responsibility she felt. Well, you know, and I'm sure she did. I mean, I think that anybody that was around anything that something happened that was bad, you think, well, should I, should I have noticed something? Should I have seen or heard or something like that that would have clued us in, you know, before? Now, we all sat down with her and she told us she was a gynecological oncologist and she practiced in a medical building called Research Medical Tower. That medical building is next to Research Hospital in Kansas City, Missouri. And she started telling us the story. And basically, when she had moved to this medical building, she decided to use the pharmacy that was located in the medical building to prepare her chemotherapeutic IV medications for her cancer patients. And the name of the pharmacy was Research Medical Tower Pharmacy. She told us that she would send orders to them. And they would take them and they would prepare the medicines and they would bring them to her that morning before the patients came in to receive their infusions. And she told us that the name of the pharmacist that owned the pharmacy was Robert Courtney and that he was the one who typically mixed everything for her. So now we have two names. We know the physician that's telling the story and we know the name of the pharmacist and his name is Robert Courtney. So she started to tell a story about how she came to learn about this. And we're talking to her July 27th, 2001. I will continually point out the date, the timeline, because to me, that's kind of important in this investigation when I get to the end. But in May of 2001, a drug representative from the pharmaceutical company called Eli Lilly did what they call a lunch and learn with her staff. And what that means is the drug rep will come in and will typically bring in lunch. What they want to do is they want to kind of like promote their product. This drug rep, his name was Daryl Ashley, and he was there talking about his product that was called Jimzar. And Jimzar treats various forms of cancer, including ovarian cancer. And so during the conversation with one of the nurses for Dr. Hunter, he mentions the fact that you tell me that you're using a lot of Jimzar. And when I look at the purchasing history of the area including Robert Courtney's pharmacy, it just doesn't look like there's enough product being sold to match up with the utilization you have. Wow. Yes. Yes. So it's like, oh gosh. So after the luncheon, the nurse went into Dr. Hunter's office because she was not at the luncheon and told her about her conversation with Daryl Ashley. 
And, you know, that got Dr. Hunter thinking. In her mind, she's probably thinking about patients who, you know, had odd responses. And, and the thing with cancer treatments is everybody reacts differently to them. It's not like everybody's going to have the same situation. They're not going to have the same side effects and that sort of thing. So, but she started thinking and she started worrying about this. So what she did was she took a sample from leftover chemotherapy IV preparation that Robert Courtney had made for one of her patients. The product was called Taxol. It wasn't an Eli Lilly product yet. That is a Bristol Myers Squibb product. So she started to try to find a lab who would test the potency of that sample to see if it contained the dosage that she had actually ordered. That seems, I mean, in hindsight, it seems, okay, I guess she did that. But it does seem like a leap. You've heard this thing about more drugs being utilized than have been sold. And then, then she knows that some of her patients aren't having reaction that she thought they may have, you know, I guess hair loss, not being able to hold food down or, or whatever. And from that, it's amazing. I'm, I'm giving her credit for taking it to the next level. Other people might be like, hmm, that's interesting. Oh, absolutely. What she did was heroic. She had to also kind of look inside herself because these are people that trusted her as well. She didn't do anything wrong, but she might've had a little bit of guilt Maybe, you know, we always think about what ifs, you know. She was not going to let it go. Several labs weren't able to help her. So she was finally able to find a lab in Pennsylvania. And they tested that sample in May of 2001. And at the same time, she actually sent a letter to Eli Lilly commenting on this and wanting help, you know, whatever Eli Lilly could do. But she didn't really get any help at all from Eli Lilly at all. So the test is sent off. And in early June, she gets results from this Taxol sample. And it actually contained a third of a dose that she had ordered. Now, she was like, oh, my gosh, what does this mean? Well, to me, when I hear this, that doesn't necessarily tell me that absolutely this person did this. Because when you prepare these medications, it's not like you buy them and so they have a really good shelf life. When you get them, you make them and they do start degrading over time because they're really made for you to mix them and give them within a, a few hours. You don't really have make them and set them on your shelf for like two, three months. So to me, that wasn't necessarily absolutely smoking gun evidence. But in the meantime, what she decided to do after she got this test back is she wanted to stop using Robert Courtney to make her medications, which that's the smart thing to do. So what she did is she went out she purchased the equipment that you would need to make these medications properly, which is very expensive. And she also sent a nurse out to be trained to be able to mix these medications. Could so, you talk a little bit more about that? What, what actually would a pharmacist do to make the medication? And what was this nurse learning how to do? Okay. So, and, and some pharmacists do this, and typically they're pharmacists that are actually hired by the oncology practice or that sort of thing. So for, for Robert in his pharmacy, in his own pharmacy, he had a room and you actually have to have what's called a laminar flow hood. It makes sure that it's a sterile environment that we're making this IV in because you don't want to put something in somebody's body that's not sterile. So that's one requirement. And then you're actually going to order and everybody's familiar whether they've seen it in person or on TV, the little bags that hang on the poles that will go into a patient's ports or into their veins or whatever, and you'll see them getting an IV that way. Well, for these chemotherapeutic agents, you have those little bags, and they will typically have like well, saline, which is kind of like salt water type of thing. That's kind of like what our body's made of. Then you will order the medication, and the medication will come in a vial. Gemzar, which was the Eli Lilly product, comes in a glass vial and it's like a powder. So you actually have to mix that with some other diluent, which could be like sterile water or, or saline or whatever, and you mix it in that vial. Then you take, depending on the dose that's prescribed by the doctor, how much out of that vial and inject it into the IV bag. In the case of Taxol, it comes in a vial, but it's already in a liquid. So you don't have to mix it in the vial and then pull it out. You just pull out what you need and you, you inject it. You have a little bag that it's basically, maybe it's one gram of Gemzar 
in a 100 milliliter bag of saline. And that is actually what you will see when it's like hung on a, a pole or hooked onto an infusion machine. And that's the medication that you'll see going into people's ports and veins. And that's, you see that pretty much every day on many TVs. And that's basically what you're mixing. At that time, there weren't a lot of rules on what the pharmacist necessarily had to keep in the pharmacy or notate when they were mixing them. So there's not any paperwork saying, I mix this on this day, this, 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 and I bought this, this, and this. And if a nurse is going to be trained, uh, they have to go through special training. And Dr. Hunter had to spend a lot of money. A laminar flow hood is extremely expensive, and the upkeep is very expensive. So she just knew that she could not continue using Robert Courtney. And I think she wanted to take control of everything with her practice. Instead of going out to maybe another pharmacy that would mix these or doing something else, she wanted to bring it in-house. So at the time that we're talking with her, her nurse is actually the person who will mix this. That's just fascinating that she took that decisive action as soon as she thought something was wrong. Comparing that to Eli Lilly and Bristol Myers Squibb, who may have gotten some indication something was wrong and did not take it as far. Now, in regards to that, some people think that that information was kind of like almost a smoking gun as well. It is evidence and it does show something. But however, what I will tell you also is back then, you did not have a system that tracked everything where it went. And a pharmacy could actually choose to opt in or opt out with the certain organizations that track medications. Like I buy drug A, I buy 10 vials of it, and then it comes to my pharmacy. So it goes from the manufacturer to the wholesaler to me and somewhere that's tracked. Back in 2000, that was not necessarily the case. And just because it didn't seem like as much was being sold, that might not be what was happening because it could have been that he was not reporting purchases to any sort of independent agency. So that is something that as the years have gone on has become more strict. Okay. That's nice to know that the manufacturers now have a system of tracking. You can well imagine after hearing this disturbing tale, how we all felt, but I think that we all still had in our mind like, okay, Okay, we have this information, we know who it is, we know what we need to do, but we still thought it is quite possibly still a mistake. You know, maybe he didn't really do this. After she told us this story, she gave the FDA agents seven little test tubes. And in the test tubes, there was a label on it, and it had initials, and it had what the medication was, and how much it should have been as far as its potency, how much medication should be in the medicine, you know, like one gram or 250 milligrams. And she gave those samples to the FDA and said those were some of the last remaining patients that she had utilized Robert Courtney to mix the medications. So they took custody of them and they said that they would send them off to the FDA lab in Ohio to be tested. We're just kind of talking about everything. You know, we talked about different things like, you know, how did she do the orders and how was it paid for? And we learned that Robert Courtney for these IVs, he did not bill insurances. Where you, you and I go to a pharmacy and get a prescription filled, it typically goes through our insurance. And we pay him, whatever. In this situation, what he would do, he would mix the medications and mix it and say there's one gram in this bag. And then he would charge her $1,000 for that bag, okay? And then he would charge the doctor. She would take ownership of the bag. She would infuse, infuse it into the patient. Then she would actually bill the insurance for the office visit, the infusion, and the medication as a whole. So there wasn't anything as far as insurances for those particular medications that were going through Courtney's pharmacy, which as we go forward in the story, that will be an important thing that we utilize. And it actually helped us. So to get back to the conversation with Dr. Hunter, we spent a lot of time just talking about, you know, how she worked with him, all those sorts of things. 
We can hear your your oh. uh, little dog barking in the background, oh. but this is a dog friendly podcast. So we're just going to acknowledge that Casper is barking in the background and, and continue on. Casper, be a good boy. <laughs> Thank you. I'm sorry about that. So during our conversation with Dr. Verta Hunter, this was actually brought up by Agent David Parker, and I thought it was brilliant. He brings up the idea. He goes, Dr. Hunter, do you think that if you called Robert Courtney on the phone and had a reasonable excuse, would he start making the IVs for you again? So she says, I think he would. Now, her personal attorney says, like, wait a minute. <laughs> wait a minute. Let's talk about this, you know. But in the end, we did decide that we would kind of come up with the situation and whether you want to call it a sting or a covert purchase or however you want to call it, to try to get information real time on what Robert Courtney was doing. What did she tell him was the reason that she was no longer purchasing the uh, chemotherapy drugs from him? So when we had Dr. Hunter actually call Robert Courtney on the telephone, we actually had agents there recording the call. So she calls him, gets him on the phone, Robert himself, and she says, Robert, would you be willing to make my chemo drugs again? My nurse that I trained to make them in the office is pregnant. And so she can't do it for a while. So would you be willing to do it? He jumped right on it. He was, he was gung-ho ready to start making these IVs again. So here we have the recording that uh, he was willing to do this. And we're like, okay, great. So initially, you know, we were talking about, do we need to have a lot of information on these patients? But since he did not bill the insurance, that made it easy for us because he doesn't have to have any sort of real person. We didn't have to create some sort of fake insurance. We just gave fake names to Dr. Hunter. She created fake orders for those fake patients with their fake date of births, allergies, that sort of thing. And she sent it to Robert Courtney. We were golden. That's all he needed to know. He didn't need to know anything else. The meds were ordered and they were to be mixed and delivered to Dr. Hunter's office on August 7th. Now, remember, the first time we actually met Dr. Hunter was actually July 27th. So not a lot of times going on. So she ordered some Gemsar and some Taxol. And she ordered a couple of other cancer drugs by the name of Paraplatinum and Platinol. Of course, these were fake patients. So the morning of August 7th, there's actually an FDA agent and an FBI agent in the back of Dr. Hunter's office. And actually, Robert Courtney himself delivered them that day to the nurse or receptionist. I'm not sure which it was that took custody. And she walks to the back through the doors and there's the agents. They take custody of these IVs. They immediately leave to go catch a plane to go to the FDA lab in Cincinnati to get this tested. So we're doing everything kind of real time. That happens on August 7th. So later that day on August 7th, we get the results of those samples that Dr. Hunter gave the FDA agents in the little test tubes. The percentage of medications in the vials, the highest percentage was 39% of the ordered dose. The lowest was 17% of the ordered dose because we don't know if those samples could have degraded and you know we didn't we didn't follow them from the very day or do them as quickly okay but it was still evidence that maybe there's something going on so the samples that FDA sent in took what would that be from July 27th to August 7th however many days that would be but there were still problems with that because you know we didn't know where it was sitting it could have been degrading you know it's still evidence but it's not great evidence so actually, the very next day, we get the lab results from those covert purchases. These doses should have been exactly what she ordered. The highest out of the covert purchases was 28% of what she ordered. The lowest was around 0%, hardly a trace of medication in that bag. Wow. You would have thought, well, maybe he's suspicious. Maybe, you know, we're not going to get the results that we think between the covert samples and the samples that the doctor had given to you, and they were worse. And so he was not suspicious at all. Oh, no. No. He's not suspicious at all. And later on, we actually kind of talk a little bit about this because, I mean, these results was really an OMG moment for all of us. Okay. 
because, you know, we didn't know what was going to happen because like you bring up, maybe he was suspicious, you know, so maybe what if we'd have gotten results back and they were actually what they were supposed to be? We'd probably still investigate. We'd still be looking at a lot of different things. But with this, we knew that somebody had to do something on purpose. Many of us were shocked because I think many of us really didn't believe that a pharmacist would really do this. This is a public safety issue. We need to start doing stuff. And so, you know, we start working with the U.S. Attorney's Office in the Western District of Missouri. And the prosecutor that we worked with, his name is Gene Porter. I'd worked with him on several other health care fraud cases. And he, he was kind of the lead health care fraud prosecutor there in that office. So we all started working together. Some of the other U.S. attorneys were, were working with us on it because we needed to get uh, the affidavit together because we knew we needed to do a search warrant. We want to look into who Robert Courtney is. We were able to get it together. So August 8th is when we got the results. We actually got the search warrant and were able to do a search warrant on August 13th. As you can see, everything is progressing very quickly. We should also note that that's not necessarily how it works in white collar crime cases and fraud cases. Lots of reviewing of files, but that didn't happen in this case. Absolutely not. I mean, some healthcare cases can take years just to, you know, get from start to finish. And we're moving at a very fast pace because we felt like we needed to. So we've got the search warrant that we're going to do on August 13th. Now, what we decided also is we wanted to get a second set of covert purchases. So Dr. Hunter had called in the day before and ordered some other medications to be prepared by Robert. And we're all staged in various parking lots around this medical tower and the hospital that's located in Kansas City, and we're waiting. So we actually sent the same agents who had gone in before, and they waited. And after Robert brought those covert purchases to the doc, Dr. Hunter's office, and they took custody of it, when they came out and get, got ready to get in their car to leave, that's when we decided to go in and do the search warrant. Now, typically when we do these search warrants, you actually go into the business or the office or whatever, and you pretty much shut it down and you just take it over. And when we were talking about the affidavit for this, I started talking about, well, in a pharmacy, this is a pharmacy where you have people all across the Kansas City area who may have called in their medications to Research Medical Tower Pharmacy. And that pharmacy may have filled their medicines with their insurance could be medicines for diabetes. It could be medicines for high blood pressure. It could be medicines for anything. We need to set up some sort of situation that either when people come up to the door, they're able to have that pharmacy reverse that insurance and transfer it to another pharmacy, or do we decide we're going to let them pick up their blood pressure medication? And in the end, we did put that in there and we decided to put someone outside the pharmacy and we kept note of anybody that needed to go in. We had agents in there and the patients were able to go in and buy their blood pressure medication, which are tablets. They're not something that's made by the pharmacist. Or in some cases, they'd go in and like, I don't want to get my medicine here. Will you transfer it to the pharmacy down the street or whatever? Yeah. Because- when, when, when you walk into a pharmacy and it's full of FBI agents and other investigators, That's kind of a clue that you may not want to use that pharmacy. And I don't have data on how many people decided that they would purchase their medication. But I, just like you say, that was a wonderful question, is most of them probably said, I want you to transfer it to a different pharmacy. But we had to have that in place because you wouldn't know when the pharmacy would be back open or if it ever would. So we need to be able to take care of the patients as well. And I think we did a wonderful job in that. But sure, you know, you see a bunch of agents with blue jackets with FBI on the back or agents with stuff that said FDA. Yes, you do. (laughs) You think about that. And you have to give yourself credit because I don't think most investigators and prosecutors would have thought about that. But having you there as a, you know, former pharmacist was very helpful. Actually, I probably wore my pharmacist hat a little more in this case than my FBI agent had. So, but I I just felt like it was important. And I'm pretty sure that's why Judy assigned me to the case. I tried to put my mind in that area as much as I could. So when we went in with the search warrant, Robert Courtney was interviewed and David Parker and an FDA agent by the name of Stephen Holt actually interviewed him in a car. They basically told him, you know, hey, there's a problem with these IVs. He admitted to mixing them, the ones that we just picked up. 
and he acted surprised that they did not contain the medications that were ordered. I actually went with another FDA agent by the name of Laura Stewart, and we went looking for one of the staff pharmacists who worked along with Robert, but he pretty much ran the pharmacy for your everyday medications, like your blood pressure, that sort of thing. But he was on vacation, so we came back to the search warrant to do the forensics because we wanted to image the computer that he utilized to do any prescriptions or the data that was in there billing, all those sorts of things. So we did a lot of things. We took a lot of electronic information. We took a lot of copies of paper, that sort of thing. You know, we were there most of the day. And of course, you know, as we're doing it, we noticed that there are news reporters lurking about after a while. And because there was like a big lobby around the pharmacy, because the pharmacy was actually inside of the tower. And they're all looking and wondering. And of course, As all the staff were being interviewed, I don't know what they would go and say to everybody else. Probably, oh my gosh, they think that this guy's doing something wrong with cancer drugs. So, of course, that's getting out in the public. When we left and we were taking the last bit, I mean, there were news cameras everywhere. So, we knew that there was going to be a lot of talk in Kansas City, at least Kansas City, about this. As time goes on, you know, we start getting calls and everything at the office asking about this. So, Judy Lewis decided that what we needed to do is we needed to set up an FBI hotline because we knew that there were going to be tons of calls from potential patients, maybe survivors, maybe healthcare professionals, and we wanted to be able to answer all those calls. And we knew that, you know, the regular receptionist wouldn't be able to handle that. We knew that just a regular voicemail would not be able to handle that. So we did set up a hotline and we also decided to set up a command post in Kansas City. And we did. We set that up and we brought the FDA in to work with us. Judy asked me to put together kind of a script for all agents because, you know, here we'd have agents that worked kidnappings or agents who worked violent crimes. You know, they're not used to healthcare investigations. So she asked me to put together a script that would talk about the different medications and their names and questions that we might ask these patients or physicians that would relate to their care, cancer and the treatment and that sort of thing. So we brought everybody in and we kind of went over it. During the hotline, all these calls would come into the command post and everybody is creating them. I'm sure you've been involved in a lot of command posts and we were going to return every single call that came in. FBI agents were paired with FDA, but there weren't as many FDA agents in Kansas City. So a lot of times it'd be two FBI agents or just one if it was a phone call. We basically answered approximately 3,500 calls. As more news got out about this and we started talking to more people, it was extremely emotional work. I can remember one example that I had, and I had to call this young man. He currently lived in California. So I called him back and he starts asking me questions. His mom had actually gone to Dr. Hunter. She had passed away two years before. And, you know, talked about, you know, how she went through cancer treatment. It didn't seem to work. You know, she really didn't seem to have terrible, terrible side effects. And she passed away. We started talking about this. And, of course, I couldn't tell him for sure that his mother didn't get the medications. But there was a possibility that she didn't because she did kind of fit the profile of not getting better, kind of hit kind of the profile of not the side effects, although that can happen when you get the medication. and he started crying on the phone and it it broke my heart. He goes, my goodness, you know, and you know, when my mom got the cancer and she had the diagnosis and she went through the treatment and then she died, we went through the grieving process. And in our minds, like we did everything we could to give her a chance to, to beat the cancer and to be alive. And now, you know, after we've gone through closure, now you're telling me that it is possible that she didn't get the medicine that could have kept her alive and she could have been alive today. I I tell you, it, it was so emotional. I felt so bad for that man. For some reason, that one call really stands out to me. It was just, you could just feel it. And every call to victims was like that. And it was emotional work for all of us. We spent a lot of time together talking about it and they actually brought in a therapist to kind of talk to us a couple of times to, to process what we were 
you know, what we were absorbing kind of like a sponge and what we were hearing and how we were dealing with it. And, and the fact that some of us may have had loved ones who fought and battled cancer and either won or lost that battle. So it just, it, it was, it was a lot to take. And you'd see big old burly FBI agents, you know, tears coming down. You know, no matter what kind of FBI agent, what you worked, we were all affected. We continued the investigation with Robert. You know, at this time, we're pretty sure this man has done a really horrible thing. And we keep bringing him in and his attorneys keeps letting him be an interview. Initially, he admits to us that he had done this for a few medications for the last few months. And the reason he did it was because he had a $600,000 tax bill and he had made a $1 million pledge to his church, Northland Cathedral in Kansas City, and he still owed the money. So that was his first excuse on why he'd done it, and he'd done it only for a few months and only for those few meds. So we keep talking to him. We actually have him do polygraphs. And as he comes up deceptive, we keep interviewing him. And as we keep interviewing him, it gets longer and longer. He'll say like, oh, you know, I forgot, you know, I did tamper with these back in December, you know, and it just kept going on and on more medicines, you know, initially what started out with two, it just kept getting bigger and bigger. And as we go through the investigation, we learn even more because some of these things might have to be cancer medications. And as we learn, there's other medications for other different sort of illnesses that actually he tampered with. So, of course, we've got this case that we started July 27. So we have all this information. We have these samples. We have these test results. So we actually, on August 23rd, 2001, Courtney's indicted. And that's less than one month from the initial meeting. Like we said before, this is very, very fast for a yeah, health care uh, case. And he was charged with eight counts of tampering with a consumer drug. He was charged with six counts of adulteration of a drug. And he was charged with six counts of misbranding. A drug. Now, tampering with a consumer product, many of us would think back to when you had that person do that with Tylenol many, many, many years ago. And so that basically talks about somebody that knowingly does something to a medication and that it could cause bodily injury. The adulteration, we think about the IVs, they were mixed in a way to reduce the quality and the strength of what the product should have been. And the mislabeling, he put these labels on it saying it had a certain dose of medication in it. And by not making it that way, he's providing false information with that. So that is actually what he's indicted with. But after he's indicted, we also get the lab results back from the second covert purchase. And the high of that was 53% and the low was 13 Now, some of those products that we had him make, they weren't Taxol and Gemzar. So they weren't quite as expensive. So, I, you know, who even knows how he chose the percentage that he would put in? Maybe he just had the one bottle and had three IVs and just put randomly something in it. It almost seems that way. Could you give us an idea of how much these drugs cost? I mean, what type of money was he saving when he diluted them? The easiest way for me to explain that, and let's just start out with Gemzar. Hey, you have a vial of Gemzar and it comes in one gram. And I'm not giving exact cost of this, but just in general, let's just say that that vial cost a thousand dollars. And say that a doctor orders four different people to get one gram. If he did it correctly, he would need four vials to mix those four IVs. But for Robert, what he would do is he would just mix that one vial and randomly pull out whatever and use one vial for all four. Maybe one got 25%, maybe one got 10%, you know, it's just kind of random. So he would bill that, say, $1,000 for four. So that's $4,000, but he only utilized enough medication to charge $1,000. So instead of making $1,000, he's going to make $4,000. So his profit is greatly increased. Absolutely. It just seems like when the salesperson noticed that the amount being sold to the doctors was not the same amount that the manufacturer sold to the pharmacists, it seems like somebody should have noticed that, you know, at the very beginning. Because they don't track it as much. And at that point, pharmacies could opt out of reporting. 
Now, in general, the drug rep should see what's being bought. And, you know, that would include, I guess, product being sold to pharmacies that would mix it or those that would actually do it in their office. Now, he would also have to have information from the doctors to know utilization. And so you wouldn't really go down that road to look at it unless something asked you to do that. I think even if they did that, I don't think they would definitely go to the thought process of a pharmacist or someone else mixing it improperly. I think they probably thought of what is considered gray market or black market drugs. You know, buying from a non-reputable wholesaler that doesn't, you know, track anything or maybe stolen product or getting it from someone else, like black market type of thing. I think their mind probably went to that more so, or stolen drug, that area, as opposed to thinking that a pharmacist would sit here and decide to not give a patient the medication they needed as they battle cancer. Did Robert Courtney ever do that? Buy pharmaceuticals off of the black market or the gray market? Yes. yes. Oh, he did that too. Yes. And with the investigation for him, I mean, what he did with mixing these is the worst crime and the biggest thing, but this man pretty much did anything that would make him money. Buying from the black market, maybe even creating insurance claims that he never filled, trading supplies for anybody for samples to then sell as product. Pretty much anything he could do to make money for himself, he did it, pretty much. What he did with these chemo is, is the worst, and it's the thing that we concentrated on. There were, the, there were a lot of other small, typical pharmacy fraud, healthcare frauds that he could have been charged with, but this was just the, this was just the, the big one, you know? He was pretty much into whatever he could be into. So he's indicted very quickly, and like we say, we got those results. So we get to the very first part of September. And at that time, that's when we named this case. It became a major case in the FBI, which allows for more resources and help from other offices, that sort of thing. And it was named Diluted Trust. And where'd that name come from? Well, actually, we were in kind of the the squad area talking late one day. And I was sitting there talking with my supervisor, Judy Lewis, and we just kind of talked about names that would fit and if they would allow us to use the name. And we just kind of brainstormed and came up with diluted trust. And we thought it fit appropriately. You had a profession that was considered the most trusted in the country and they had done this. So we thought it kind of fit and they did allow us to have that name. And at that point in September, this case, diluted trust was the number one case in the FBI. It was number one. So Washington, D.C., the Hoover Building, they wanted us to come to Washington, D.C. to talk about the case. And we actually flew, myself and Judy Lewis and the special agent in charge, Kevin Stafford, we flew to Washington, D.C. on September 10th, 2001. So in the morning of September 11th, 2001, we were actually... It felt like we were in a basement conference room waiting for the new director, Director Mueller, to come down to kind of go over this, to kind of review the case for them because they wanted to know about what was going on. Well, we never had that meeting because as we're sitting there, people came in through the doors and says, oh, my gosh, a plane has hit one of the World Trade Centers in New York. So, of course, we all know what happened that day. We all know what, where we were. We know what we were doing. That meeting never occurred. We continued our case, of course, but, you know, a lot of resources did have to go to that investigation. We continued to follow up on the hotline calls. We continued interviews. We continued interviewing Robert. We continued having discussions between the prosecutor, Gene Porter, and Robert Courtney's defense attorneys. There was a lot of talk about this case, and, you know, we had a lot of discussion. We did indict him on the tampering and the adulteration and misbranding, but a lot of people out there probably thought he should have been charged with murder because a lot of people felt like he murdered these people. True. And in many cases, you know, they're, they're right. But the problem is trying to meet that burden of proof. One, we didn't have smoking gun evidence on particular patients. And when you're battling cancer, 
you could line up four people and do the exact same thing and one person would do well and one person wouldn't. So, I mean, there was that problem with the burden of proof. Could we get beyond a reasonable doubt? And then we also started thinking about, okay, you know, we're going to, we're going to bring in experts. They're going to bring in experts. We could, we could run a chance of not, you know, being able to prove this. And we also started thinking about public safety. You know, what did the people need to know? So, you know, we basically said, okay, we're going to stay with this. And the prosecutors and the defense attorneys, his defense attorney was by the name of J.R. Hobbs, who's a very good man. He had a really hard time with this. And I think he actually had threats during this case because he was defending Robert Courtney, but he was a good man and he was just doing his job. So they were able to come up with an agreement and that we could all kind of try to live by and go with. So, you know, as time goes on, we're kind of doing this job and we're still dealing with, you know, everything going on with 9-11. I actually spent two weeks in New York on fresh kills on Staten Island digging through the World Trade Center rubble. So there's lots of things going on in 2001. That's probably 2020 will be remembered kind of like 2001 for different reasons, but we'll all remember what we were doing. Absolutely. I was thinking that myself. We continued the case. We continued to work. Eventually, we came to an agreement with the defense. And on February 26, 2002, which is not very long from when we started the case, there was a plea agreement. So Courtney appeared before the court, before the judge, and he pled guilty. This is really the first time that the public heard him say, yes, this really happened. And I can tell you that I had a lot of people in different professions that I used to work with as being an FBI agent. And many of them called me while we were doing this investigation before this plea. And they basically said to me, they're like, what in the world are you doing to this man? It's that there's no way he did this. You all are ruining his life. You're ruining his career. You're probably destroying his business. And you've probably got it wrong. That's awful that you all are doing this. I mean, I got more than one call about that from, you know, just professionals you know, across Kansas City. And, you know, basically all I could say at that point, I was like, well, I can't really (laughs) comment on the investigation. You'll just have to continue to, to watch. So when he said he would plead guilty, that courtroom, because, you know, there are a lot of supporters. There were people from his church, his family, you know, victims, all these people, because, you know, they're just wondering about this. It almost felt like the air was sucked out of the room. If you can imagine that. And you, it was kind of an, an audible kind of like, Oh, you know, just over and over with different people. So publicly, he was denying that he did this. Yes, initially, you know, he was saying he didn't do it. This is the first time anybody other than those of us involved in the investigation knew. So he gets up and does that. And he gives this statement going on about, you know, he doesn't know why he did this. And, you know, uh, it's horrible and all that. But, you know, it didn't feel genuine to anybody, not not to us, not to the public. And even the very next day after his plea agreement, the you know how they do political cartoons in the papers? There was actually a cartoon and it had like a big pill bottle. And on the label, it said Courtney's apology you know, not tolerated, may not work or something like that. So, I mean, it kind of spoke for what everybody felt. How could he plead guilty to doing this and then say, you know, he doesn't know why he did it? I think all of us at that point are thinking, yeah, you're greedy, you know. And did he have a lot of money? He had a ton of money. During the investigation, we do freeze his assets. They come up to like $19 million. And that's a lot of money. I've worked as a pharmacist. I know many pharmacists. My stepdad owned pharmacies and none of them have $19 million. His scheme or schemes, everything he did that revolved around greed, he made a lot of money from it. Absolutely. But the public, they didn't look at it that way. They just thought he was a great businessman and that, you know, he was innovative in his profession. So it wasn't like just because he was rich, people would think he did things wrong, but he did. He had a ton of money. Now, the plea agreement actually had set into it. We were asking a sentencing of like 17.5 to 30 years. Uh, A lot of people didn't like that. You know, they wanted more, but this is what we went with. This is what the, the, the prosecution and the defense could agree with. Part of his plea agreement where there were going to be restitution monies. And that would involve these monies that we had actually frozen. And it was the 20 counts 
of the tampering. It was of the misbranding, adulteration. And we actually did add enhancements for the crime if it could be bodily injury or worse, you know, including death or if it was a, an, a vulnerable population with cancer. So those were some of the enhancements that we were able to do to get more uh, years added onto his sentence. Now, he also had to agree to do polygraphs anytime we wanted him to before sentencing. And the biggest one that we thought was so important is he had to participate in a complete debriefing of everything that he did. A complete debriefing had to be truthful. If he didn't, we could go back to the court and say, hey, we throw this out. We, we're going to charge you with even more. We felt that it was important for the community and public safety. So that was a big one for us as far as what we wanted to bring. This happened on February 26, 2002. We start our debriefings with Robert Courtney on March 1st, 2001. And they would go for two weeks. Some of them we did in the Lansing Correctional Facility in Lansing, Kansas, where he was being held. And some of them, we actually did it at the U.S. Attorney's Office in the Western District of Missouri, and he would be brought down. He actually liked those because he got to get out. Preparing for this, he had actually provided to us a list of medicines that he could just think off the top of his head that he had tampered with. And they included cancer drugs. They also included medications for other type of illnesses where some of them might actually have been injectable. A lot of those cases, those would be where actually the patient went in with the prescription and they did utilize their insurance. So it was kind of a mix of a lot of different things. He also put down medications that you give people before they get the, their chemo medication to keep them from getting sick because he knew that if he didn't give them the medicine that would get them sick, he didn't have to put the medicine to keep them from having those side effects. So he did those as well. Oh, so, that is so devious. Oh, yeah. Yes, yes. I mean, we're, we're not talking about somebody that doesn't know what he's doing. Very intelligent. So he provides that list. And so we take it back and we have imaged his whole pharmacy computer. So we have everything that he had dispensed, put in his computers. I think it went back to around 91 or 92. So we went back and there was an agent on my squad. Her name is Luann Stovall. And she was kind of like on our squad, kind of the computer geek. I say that in the nicest way. So she and I worked together. They had actually, by being a major case, we actually were able to have a computer that was kind of dedicated to this investigation. So it just, you didn't have to go all over. We had a room, we had that computer, we could work on it, we can concentrate on it. So she and I went in and she started working and she was able to create a list of all medications he had gone through and we compared it with his list. Then she did a printout for me and then I sat there going through it for trying to find if there were any additional medications that he forgot because he did, he did the list by memory. So I went through everything, created that list that we wanted to go over everything with him. So we go in for the debriefing. The first thing he is told by prosecutor Gene Porter is his requirement. There's three. One, tell the truth. Two, tell the truth. Three, tell the truth. Well, he kind of giggled at that. And so I, I'm, I'm, I figured that's what you were going to say. And, you know, we are trying to build rapport with him. And he knew that I was a pharmacist. And so part of my job, I believe, was to make him feel comfortable, make him feel like he had somebody that he could connect with that kind of knew where he was coming from. You know, sometimes he would like make little pharmacist jokes to me, things like that. I'd kind of laugh at him. And it, that, that was that was something <laughs> to do that. So I would yeah. also think that your presence would keep him honest because you would know if he was trying to use his, his, his education or his skills to pull the wool over everybody else's eyes. You, you would be there and you would know like, no, that's not how that medication works or that's not how it's supposed to happen. And Jerry, I guess that's a good point. And I probably did that on a couple of occasions, you know, call him out on some things. And I was able to put the different things into the list. So we, we talked to him a lot about his crimes, about his pharmacy. He, he told us, he says, well, you know, I never thought that I would be caught. He said, I thought what would happen is somebody would just come up to me and say, man, 
is there something wrong with this medication? It just doesn't seem to be working as right. Do you think you've got a bad generic drug or do you think that the product wasn't good? You know, it should be recalled. And he would know at that time that I need to stop. He said, he said, that's what he thought. And really, as he continues to talk, you, you realize that he doesn't have remorse over these crimes that he committed. His remorse was that he got caught. That's pretty much all the remorse that he had. Then it came down to my time to sit down with him. And, you know, I'd be like right across from him. And I'm trying to be open and receptive and build rapport with him. I went over every medication and I would go over the medication and I would say the name. And I would ask him, did you ever mix this medication improperly? And he'd say, yes. There might have only been like maybe one or two occasions he said he didn't tamper with something. And he basically say that it was because he couldn't, because it would have been evident. I would ask him, did he remember the first time that he would have mixed it improperly? And he might say yes or no. Mostly he couldn't remember exactly when he first started doing it. And then I would ask him, did he remember the last time? You know, and a lot of times he'd say, no, not really. And, or he'd say, well, maybe, you know, the last day before, you know, you all closed me down or something like that. But there was one medication and I wish I could remember the name of the medication that I asked him. Did he remember the last time that he had improperly mixed a medication? He looked at me and he says, oh, yes, I do remember the last time that I diluted it improperly because it was for the wife of a friend of mine. He did this purposely on someone he considered a friend, his wife. We're all sitting there. And I think I remember looking at his attorney. He was kind of like catty corner for me. And he like turned gray. And you can see that we all like reacted to that. And he said it just like we were sitting having a conversation about what we're going to have for lunch. You know, I mean, it was like he didn't, he didn't say it in a way that like, oh my gosh, you know, I did that. I don't know why. He just said it. It was unbelievable. Some of the other things I would ask him, did he ever remember not putting any of the medication in the IVs? And on occasion, he would say, yes, I didn't put any medications. Some of the things that I would ask him that would be more specific being a pharmacist is some of these chemo medications have a color to them. There's some that are red and some that are blue. So I asked him about that and he basically told me, he said, well, I knew how much I could put in that there would actually be some sort of color. So I knew that I couldn't put nothing in it because there'd be no color in it. And, you know, and I asked him something, it's like, you didn't ever consider like doing something that would duplicate the co- color. And he goes, oh, I wouldn't do that. I'm like, well, if you didn't put their medicine in a lot. So, uh, yeah, he would oh, talk about. I, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not that bad that I would put, no, you know, I color do or dye in and it. And I'm like, oh my gosh, you know, I mean, it, it's, you know, so he would say that. And then a couple of times on the medications that you give people, a lot of people get sick to their stomach when they take cancer drugs. So a lot of times a doctor will give you a small IV of a medication. One of them is called Zofran and another one is called Anzimet. And you'll give that to them. And so it will keep them from getting sick. They're not throwing up when they get home, that sort of thing. So we kind of talked about those as well. And he did try to justify giving them less. You know, he said, I think I read somewhere where they didn't need that much. And I was like, what you're talking about is for oral medications, not injectable. You know, he'd go, okay, okay. And we'd just move on, you know, because I wasn't trying to get him all riled up because I wanted him to be open and to feel like he could tell, you know, I was was kind of pulling, trying to pull everything out from him. He got emotional. And I think that it was fake because he said that he felt bad because he diluted a med for a friend of his and he felt bad about it. And he was like crocodile tears, you know, and then the next minute he's fine. So, I mean, he did do that, but that wasn't real. That was, that was fake. And you could, you could tell, you know, so basically here we have this man who really has no remorse other than he was called. Basically we talked about it and he talked he said, well, it had to be greed. He said, but the interesting thing is I did do it for things that cost $5. And so that doesn't really take into consideration greed, really, does it? You know, he actually kind of brought that up during our talk. So, and, and what I would tell you with that, as spending time with him for those weeks, he's a monster. And I think that you could clinically probably call him a sociopath, maybe just a horrible individual, <laughs> probably the worst person I've had, had to ever deal with. These days that we spent with him, We were all so exhausted when we left and we actually felt pretty 
nauseous from everything because of what you're listening to and you're kind of taking this in and it's like, you know, you didn't really want to eat anything because you, your stomach was upset. You felt like you ought to go home and take a shower because it was just so horrible. After we went through the whole list with all the different medications, I mean, he pretty much diluted medications that would treat HIV patients, that would treat people with like blood problems or endocrine problems, transplant patients. He did things to them. And basically, they're all medications that were either IV medications or they were injected through a syringe. And so many of those are, I guess, what you would call life-saving. Absolutely. Either either life-saving medications or quality of life medications. You know, sometimes we can't cure something, but we can make your quality of life better and extend it and that sort of things. But absolutely. You know, and then you're talking about the medications not to treat the cancer, but to treat the symptoms that go along with cancer. When they do blood tests for cancer patients, they're not looking to see the amount of the medication in your body like they do in some medications. They're actually looking at your body to see how it's reacting to the chemotherapy. They're looking at like your your blood counts, you know, your white blood cells, your your you know red blood cells, different things like that, because that actually tells the physician that, oh, hey, I need to cut back on the dose, or maybe I need to increase the dose. That sort of thing. It, it wasn't like anybody would have been able to tell how much medication was in a patient just by testing their blood. So, and that could go across the board, whether it's HIV, cancer, transplant, endocrine problems, blood problems, which kind of fall also in with oncology, that sort of thing. So basically it came down to, there were 72 drugs that he admits to doing this with, 72. It ended up being about approximately 4,200 patients that had utilized these medications, these 72 medications, and it actually came up to approximately 98,000 prescriptions or orders. Over what, a 10-year period? It's, it's more than that. I, I know it's more than that because we were only able to get information from like the very early 90s. He purchased this pharmacy in like 88. So I would imagine we have anywhere from three to four years that we don't have any information because there was no computer data to go back on. Like he either purged it, you know, or updated or got a different system or that sort of thing. So we didn't have anything to go with for that. So these 98,000 prescriptions would be from about probably 91 to 2001. So about about a decade. But that's unbelievable. 98,000 orders. So, okay, so what do we do with this information? We knew we needed to get it out there. And what we decided is that we would tie each medication to the patient and then tie it to the physician. So we decided that we would send letters to every physician provider who had prescribed or or ordered any of these medications to let them know that their patients were potentially a victim of what Robert Courtney did. And it's possible that patient A, B, and C got medications that he admits to tampering with. So your patient may or may not have gotten the medication you ordered, the amount you ordered. You may need to go back and reevaluate these patients to see if you need to do anything different for their care. And so we sent those out to all the physicians. So on December 5th, 2002, he was set to be sentenced. We're talking about less than a year and a half for this complex white collar healthcare fraud case. We knew that there were going to be tons of people that would want to come to this. We we really knew. We had the main courtroom that was the big courtroom and victims, uh, Courtney's family, they were able to come into the main courtroom. We set up a second courtroom for audio only. And so a lot of like reporters were there in the audio room and anybody that, you know, the overflow. I sat in the jury box along with my boss, Judy Lewis, and several other FBI agents and FDA agents. And it was an interesting place to sit because you're facing towards, you know, the prosecution table and the defense table. And then you can see everybody in the crowd. You know, you can see everybody that's sitting there listening and you're right to the right of the judge. It was interesting. A lot of victims and their victim families, they got up to make victim statements. That was so emotional. I remember one brave lady got up and she looked right at Courtney and she told him that he would not define her or her life. 
I think all of us were crying in the courtroom, except for Courtney. One daughter of a victim who'd passed away, she she got up and talked about how her mother would not be able to see her graduate or get married or see her grandchildren or hold her grandchildren. I mean, there really wasn't a dry eye in the courtroom, except for Robert Courtney. It was weird because we're watching him and he's sitting there like he's watching a TV show or something. I mean, he has no reactions one way or the other. You would think and, if he was going to fake any crocodile tears, this is the time to fake them. You would think. You would certainly think that that would be the case. We're all like, does anybody have tissues? Because you, you just couldn't. I mean, it just broke your heart over and over and over again. Even when Gene Porter, the prosecutor, he gets up to make his statement. And basically, he's looking at Robert and telling him, he says, you know, during this plea agreement, you have hope that you will live to reach the end of this sentence and get out of prison. He says, you're getting something that your victims didn't get because you, you took away their hope and you also took away something important like trust. They didn't get that, but you're getting that in this sentence. You should be certainly happy for that because you're getting that hope to get out eventually. The federal judge, his name is Altry Smith, he actually sentenced Robert to the maximum, which was the 30 years. And then the restitution at that point ended up to be close to about $11 million. After the sentencing, I mean, I I can remember it, and you would just see a lot of the victims. Gosh, someone was like, well, I'm glad it's over with, and I'm going to try to move forward. I'm going to try to try to get some sort of closure. And some people were like, I don't think it's enough. I think they should, he should be going to jail for, for the rest of his life. And he should have been charged with murder. It kind of, you know, and I totally understood that. I think that all of us would have loved to have been able to charge him with something to put him in prison forever. But we just needed to, you just, we had to make the smart decision and look at the burden of proof. And actually one of my neighbors was, her mom was a victim. And you know, she would always come over and see me and thank me for stopping him. You know, unfortunately, her mom passed away and everything. But she goes, I wish he'd gotten more, but I understand why he didn't. So, I mean, the, the whole community was really, I don't know, is it, it was in turmoil. They, everybody was torn up, you know, and it was actually on a lot of the national news. But locally, it, it was pretty rough. His restitution monies that typically in a case when we have these monies, a lot, a lot of the money just goes back to the government. But we had decided that we didn't want to do that. There was actually a restitution fund set up and a judge was set up to be the special master for this. We also wanted it set up so that there would not be any attorneys involved to get you know, a percentage of the funds. So what would happen with this is the victims or the victim families would file a claim with the court. And then there was a formula that was put together and it would determine how much money that person would get. And it would be dependent on, you know, how many treatments they got. You know, you might've had somebody that only went there one time, or you might have somebody that went there 12 times, but that was a part of the, the, the formula that was used. I know several that got money, including my neighbor, and they donated the money to a, a worthy cause, probably some type of cancer fund, I'm sure. All of them said it never took away the pain. I mean, that was there. And that's, a lot of them would say to you that, gosh, it's never going to go away. You know, I mean, we're glad that he stopped. We're glad he won't hurt anybody, but I I can never get over us. And I think that that even continues today. Now, parallel to our criminal investigation, there were some civil state proceedings going on as well. We weren't really involved with that as the FBI, but of course it was newsworthy. And one of the victims, one of, and it was one of the victims that was one of our first victims. Her name was Georgia Hayes. She was the first uh, civil case and she was actually awarded $2 billion in punitive damages and $225 million in actual damages. Of course, she wasn't going to see a lot of this because there wasn't money really to do that for that part. Now, that was against Robert Courtney. Now, there were also involved with that case was actually Eli Lilly and Bristol Myers Squibb. And also the liability company that insured Robert Courtney called Pharmacist Mutual. They were all kind of involved with these civil proceedings. And in the end, Eli Lilly and Bristol Myers Squibb decided that they needed to make sure this didn't go to somebody that would just totally destroy the drug company. So they agreed to pay monies to the civil proceedings. Eli Lilly paid $48 million 
Bristol Myers Squibb paid twenty four million, and Pharmacist Mutual Insurance Company they, were, they paid around twenty five million, somewhere around that. They were involved because when you're a pharmacist, you get liability insurance, and the language they had in their policies at that time put them responsible for some of his actions. Of course, now they do their policies totally different. So you know they didn't want to be totally taken out of business, so they agreed. So all this money went into the civil proceedings. There was basically one attorney and his law firm involved. They got 55% of those dollars and also court costs. So that was happening on the civil side. What was being said in the civil suit that made them decide to, to settle this case? What was their responsibility? They were trying to say that they should have known. And really, Eli Lilly was was more culpable because they'd had a letter sent to them, you know, and they really didn't do anything at all. And Bristol Myers Squibb, I mean, basically, it was like they should have known, they should have seen it, they should have stopped it. Now, my opinion on that, because being from pharmacy, yes, I think Eli Lilly should have done something, absolutely. But as far as tracking and knowing that something was happening, particularly with Bristol Myers Squibb, because a lot of times he would say he's dispensing their product, which was Taxol, but he was actually using a generic from another company. So it would have it would have been skewed anyway. I don't think they would have known because there was nothing in place for them to know because there wasn't a tracking. There wasn't all of this, you know, let's track it from, you know, the drug manufacturer, Bristol Myers Squibb, to say a wholesaler like McKesson to Courtney's Pharmacy that you could see it. You could see exactly what was going back and forth. But, and I actually spoke to an Eli Lilly representative later on that I met and I was talking to him about it. And I was like, so what exactly caused you all to decide to to agree to pay these monies. And they basically said, they're like, well, we couldn't take the chance that they would find that we did all these things and they would destroy our whole company. We don't believe that we could have, but we wanted to make an agreement. And so we agreed to pay these funds, one, to get away from the the, the proceedings and also have our name not connected to Robert Courtney at all. We were willing to pay that money because it could have been much worse. If it, it could have been way worse than the monies they paid. So they were happy to get away with that. Over these last few years, we've seen some changes. And you'll see that pharmacies have to do a whole lot more. They have to prove things. They have to get specializations. They can only order from certain places. They have to document. They have to show who made what, when they made what. A lot of pharmacies now put cameras in to watch when people are making things. Or maybe they even have like videos where one pharmacist is watching the other pharmacists. A lot of things have been put in place in different states, but it wasn't nationwide sweeping changes. It was, you know, here and there you would see changes. Probably the biggest change in pharmacy was in the state of Missouri. In this case, it really is still in the minds of all of Kansas City. It's almost 20 years from the start of the case, and it almost feels like it happened yesterday. Actually, a big event happened this year. 2020 is the year of COVID-19. What has happened in prisons across the nation is there's been a a big outbreak in COVID-19. And so the Department of Justice and Bureau of Prisons had worked together and they were looking at releasing nonviolent offenders. Well, Robert Courtney made a request to be released to home to serve out the remainder of his sentence. And he cites medical medical conditions because he thinks he's at risk for COVID-19 because he's had a couple of heart attacks and he's actually battled cancer. Isn't that karma? Yes, it is. And they decided they were going to let him out. Before they decided on that, no one was really consulted. The victims weren't given the opportunity to come in and make a statement. So what happened in Kansas City? is like all the victims got together. One of the victims called me and I live in Savannah, Georgia. I got in contact with a lot of the ex-FBI agents that I worked with, including Judy Lewis. And let me tell you what, the community came together and everybody was leaving voice messages or sending emails. You know, those of us that were former law enforcement, you know, sending emails to Attorney General Bill Barr or to the DOJ in general, you know, saying, you know, this can't happen. You know, you need to go and you need to understand this case that this man doesn't deserve to be let out. He needs to serve his time for what he did to these people. People contacted either their local, state, uh, federal representatives, 
and everybody came together. And I was actually on a call with a local Kansas City station being interviewed about this. And they were asking me questions. And all of a sudden she goes, oh my goodness, the Department of Justice decided to not let him out because of everything that's happened. And I was like, hallelujah. I really try to spend a lot of my time talking to people about this and keep, keeping people informed. I don't want this case to ever be forgotten. I don't want the victims to be forgotten. You know, I just hold all the victims really close to my heart. You were talking about how this case almost 20 years later still is of interest to people. And I understand that you've recently were interviewed for a documentary. Jerry, that is correct. I was actually contacted at the first of the year from a producer involved with the Oxygen Network, and they have a show called License to Kill. It focuses on healthcare professionals across the nation and the crimes that they have perpetrated on victims. And they wanted to do one on the Robert Courtney case. So the very first of March, I actually flew to Kansas City, Missouri. I was interviewed several of the other agents, Judy Lewis, David Parker, Stephen Holt, also the prosecutor, Gene Porter, were interviewed for this documentary. But to me, the most important is we were giving the voice to the victims or victim families. We wanted to give these people the opportunity to talk about their loved one, what they meant to them. They got to bring in pictures of them. They got to talk about their lives. Let me tell you, you better have some tissues handy because you you will need them. To me, the biggest thing and the thing that appealed to me, because I actually did get to watch a rough draft of it, were the victims. You could feel what they went through and what they miss, and you, you could feel their pain. I think that maybe it was cathartic for some of those who got to speak about their family. Well, this episode is going to be posted after the show airs. I will make sure I put a link in the episode show notes so people can go back on demand and stream it. If you go online onto the Oxygen Network, the full episode should be on the website as well. Well, I want to thank you so much. This is actually my first healthcare fraud case review, so I really appreciate it. Before you go, I want to learn a little bit more about you. So my standard question is... When did you join the FBI and why did you join the FBI? And because you are a former FBI agent, you did leave the Bureau before retirement. I also want to know why you left us. Those are great questions, Jerry. I joined the FBI in the fall of 1997. The reason I applied for the FBI is I was working in Atlanta, Georgia, as a pharmacist, and I had a friend, and he was a physician, and he owned his own small plane. And on occasion, the Atlanta FBI office would rent his plane for operations of some sort. So one time he invited me to dinner, and he invited this FBI agent and his wife to dinner. And we're sitting there talking, and this agent looks at me, and he goes, have you ever thought about applying to be an agent with the FBI? I was like, no. He said, well, right now, Healthcare fraud is the number one priority of the FBI, and it would certainly help us to have people like you who understand healthcare, because those type of cases are very complex, and you should think about it. If you want to, get back in touch with me, and I'll kind of give you what you need to do to apply. So I thought about it. I have always been inquisitive about why things happen, who they happen to, that sort of thing, and I'm thinking, I'm like, I think that I would really like this and I think that I would be good at. So I actually applied, not knowing if I would get in. And lo and behold, I get accepted to be trained at Quantico. And during the training, then I got sent out to Kansas City, Missouri. And I actually was assigned to the white collar crime that investigated healthcare fraud. That's pretty ironic because I'm pretty much the only pharmacist that was in the FBI at that time. So I was actually in Kansas City when Robert Courtney did all of this. Things happen for a reason. Some of the other agents that I work with and I went through training with, they, they always said that it was kind of destiny because I could have been in any other field office. I didn't have to be in Kansas City. So I think that it was, it was meant to be. I enjoyed being an FBI agent. I worked a, a variety of healthcare fraud cases, telemarketing cases. I did some bank cases, just different different types of cases in white collar crime. I also was a member of evidence response team in Kansas City. 
And when we start talking about 2001, I spent two weeks in the latter part of 2001 in fresh kills on Staten Island, digging through the rubble from the World Trade Center. And I got to do a lot of different things. I got to be involved with a lot of different types of cases. But what I will tell you is working this case with Robert Courtney, I spent a lot of time with other healthcare professionals. I thought a lot about everything. And then, of course, you got 9-11. So when I was digging through the rubble, I actually found body parts of people. And the thing that you think is like, gosh, you know, this person went to work just like I did. So I think 2001 was a year in which I thought about where do I make the biggest difference? What do I need to do? And I think really with the Courtney case, I decided that I needed to go back to pharmacy. I needed to make a difference. I needed to try to make up in any small way for what he did. So I left the Bureau in 2003 and actually opened up my own pharmacy in Kansas City. The name of the pharmacy was called Trust Pharmacy, and it was about five minutes from Robert Courtney's old pharmacy. It was in a medical building, kind of like Courtney's pharmacy. My specialty actually was transplant medications, but I took care of pretty much everybody in that area of Kansas City. And over time, things happen. I sold that pharmacy and I've worked in different types of pharmacy. I've worked in a long-term care pharmacy that does nursing homes. I've actually worked in compounding pharmacies and I've actually made medications like Robert did. I actually worked in a laminar flow hood. Then I left and kind of went a little ways to behavioral health. So I worked in a clinic, behavioral health pharmacy. And then I decided I wanted to move from Kansas City back to Georgia. And I moved to Savannah, Georgia, and that's where I live now. And I have been working with a company called Advanced Pharmaceutical Consultants. I initially ran a pharmacy and a behavioral health facility here in Savannah called Coastal Harbor. Now I'm actually a regional manager and I manage pharmacies who provide pharmacy services to behavioral health facilities in Louisiana, Georgia, and North Carolina. I continue to speak out about Robert Courtney. I spend a lot of time actually speaking to pharmacy students. Every year I actually go to Kansas City and speak to the University of Missouri Kansas City Pharmacy School. Ironically, that's where Robert Courtney went to pharmacy school. The way all of this has come together, I don't think it is ironic, (laughs) you know? That is true. So I spend time talking with them. I spend about two hours and I talk a lot about the Robert Courtney, but I also talk about what you need to be doing as a pharmacist. I don't want them to be cynical because of what he did. I want them to find a passion and I want them to police their own profession. Wouldn't that be nice? And I know that probably some of the pharmacists who kind of knew or in and out of the pharmacy, and I know for a fact, actually, they felt guilty because they felt like they should have seen something that would have clued them in, but none of them did. But Robert was very controlling, but I don't know. I feel like I need to pay tribute to the victims as much as I can. One of the other things I like to do to give back in regards to this horrible crime that Robert Courtney perpetrated on so many victims is I actually have students from pharmacy schools and I did it in Kansas City and I've done it in Savannah. They come and spend anywhere from four to five weeks with me on a rotation and I'm considered what they call adjunct faculty or a preceptor. And I spend time with them and on the agenda, I actually have them watch the episode that's called American Greed, and it's called Deadly Rx, I believe is the name of it, and it was aired, I think, back in 2008. I have them watch it because many of these new pharmacy students, they don't remember it because they're too young. So I have them watch it, and usually they come out shell-shocked and almost looking like they're about to cry, So, but I like for them to learn about it. And during my talks with all the different pharmacy schools, I've had like a, some professors say, well, you need to write a little book about how this was for you, because not only were you an FBI agent, you were a pharmacist. So, I mean, it's, it came at you from two different angles. So I've been working on that for years. And hopefully before the 20th anniversary of the opening of Diluted Trust, I'll have it finished. And, and what I'd really like to do is I'd really like for the monies from the sale of the book to go into some type of foundation or charity for cancer. And the other money maybe would help me to travel across the nation to different pharmacy schools or pharmacy associations and speak to them about this case and what they can do to make sure something like this never happens again. It's kind of kind of my passion, actually. 
I didn't leave the Bureau because of anything bad. I just felt like, you know, there was a fork in the path and I had to decide and I felt like the thing that I could do to make the biggest difference was to go down this path. And so here I am. I still keep in touch with a lot of the ex-FBI agents. And every now and then they'll call me to ask me a question about something that might apply to a case that they're working on. So I'm always happy to help with that. It's just that I needed to go down this road. Oh, I can understand that. And I want to make sure that when you finish your book, you let me know so that I can update the show notes for this episode included in my FBI reading resource, which are books about the FBI written by FBI agents. There's got to be so many more details that we weren't able to get to today that you'll be able to cover in the book. So I'll make sure that everybody knows when it's released. Well, thank you for doing that, Jerry. I really appreciate it. And I actually want to thank you so much for giving me this opportunity to talk about this case. I mean, it was a life-changing case for me, and I know it was a life-changing case for so many people out there who were victims or victim families. So I really appreciate you giving me this opportunity. What I like to do is to give my guests the last word. So what would you like to say? I think the biggest thing that I took from this case is that we all need to be involved and we all need to watch out for each other. We all need to be kind. We need to be understanding. And if we ever see something that doesn't seem right, be willing to step up to the plate, just like Dr. Verda Hunter did. Because let me tell you, if not for Dr. Verda Hunter, he might still be doing it today. So don't be afraid to step out there. Don't be afraid to be a voice for anybody or for yourself. And that's the end of the interview. At jerrywilliams.com, you'll find a photo of Melissa Osborne and links to articles about this case, as well as links to the recent Oxygen Channel episode of License to Kill called Deadly Pharmacists, all about the diluted trust case. There's also photos from the investigation including a copy of that editorial cartoon that Melissa mentioned. I hope you enjoyed the episode and that you'll share it with your friends, family, and associates. If they're not sure how to listen to a podcast, have them read the post on my website, How to Listen to a Podcast. And don't forget to subscribe to FBI Retired Case File Review on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. I would also love it if you checked out the link for my books and your podcast app's description of this episode. My nonfiction books, FBI Myths and Misconceptions, a manual for armchair detectives, which goes through 20 cliches and misconceptions about the FBI and books, TV, and movies. And then there's the companion book, FBI Word Search Puzzles, fun for armchair detectives. My FBI Philadelphia Corruption Squad crime series features flawed female FBI agent Carrie Wheeler in Pay to Play and Greedy Givers. All of my books are available wherever books are sold as ebooks, print books, and audiobooks. If you've already picked up copies of my books, please consider leaving a review. Reviews help readers find good books. Thank you for listening to the very end, and I hope you come back again for another episode of FBI Retired Case File Review with Jerry Williams. Thank you.